Welcome to those who are joining us uh, and dropping in right now. The webinar has just been opened up, so we are expecting quite a number of people. We're going to, uh, for a minute or so, while, we, while those people arrive, we're expecting um, you know, hundreds of people actually. So uh, we will kick off in a minute, but for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Louise Pfeiffer and I'm the Director of Philanthropy at The Life You Can Save. And uh, yeah, my job is to welcome each and every one of you. We've got people uh, signing into this webinar from all over the world. And I would like to thank you for joining us for this very special event, which is a conversation with Give Directly, an event organized and hosted by The Life You Can Save. As I mentioned, but for those of you who didn't catch it at the beginning, my name is uh, Louise. I'm the Director of Philanthropy at The Life You Can Save. And I will be welcoming um, all of you and talking a little bit about the work we do ahead of introducing our guest, MC Will Brown. Will Brown will be interviewing Give Directly's Rory Stewart and Carolyn Tetty. Um, but to start with, as I said, I'd like to share with you a little bit of information about the life you can save itself. The Life You Can Save is a nonprofit named after the book of the same name, which was by our founder, Professor Peter Singer. The Life You Can Save's mission is to change the culture of giving in affluent countries to help those who live in significant poorer countries. And we do this by sharing the compelling ideas found in the book, by sharing it widely, distributing copies of it widely and for free and making it freely available through downloads um, and audios. Additionally, we produce a curated list of nonprofits to ensure that donations are directed to high impact charities that save or improve the most lives per dollar, improving confidence in the sector while helping those most in need. For those of you who have not yet read The Life You Can Save, it's a book which catalyzes and unlocks donations and philanthropy from people of all walks of life. It's free to download as an ebook or audio book, which is read by celebrities such as Kristen Bell, Stephen Fry, Mike Shaw and Paul Simon. The book aims to inform, inspire and empower as many people as possible to act now and save lives. The number of people living in extreme poverty, those living on around US $2 a day after adjusting for purchasing power parity, has fallen over the past few decades. However, the decline has somewhat has been somewhat halted due to factors such as the pandemic and the rise in food prices caused by Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. The World Bank estimates that between 75 and 95 million extra people are living in poverty than would otherwise have been the case. Even without this worrying trend and acknowledging the positive progress to date, there are still hundreds of millions of people, around six to 700 million humans living in extreme poverty today. The world's most effective charities typically operate internationally and serve people living in poverty, yet only a small percentage of all charitable donations in the US and other affluent countries such as Australia go offshore to, to these countries, even though that's where their donations can have the greatest impact and improve the most lives per dollar. Our short-term goal as an organisation is to reach millions of people who don't know about high impact giving and to influ influence them to give to the world's poor where the donation will go the farthest. We believe that our message has the potential to move within the next three years, at least hundreds of millions of dollars of donations to our recommended charities. And at The Life You Can Save, we make it easy for donors to support these charities and provide a metaphorical bridge between the affluent and those in great need. Each of our recommended charities is vetted with our in-house charity evaluation framework using evidence, tools, and rigorous scientific research. One of our most popular and valuable tools is our interactive charity impact calculator, which allows donors to see what they get for their charitable giving. The impact calculator quantifies how donations could be used to help provide services that could save lives of some of the world's poorest people or help them to see again or transform their lives in other positive ways. Give Directly is one of our recommended charities and its pitch is as radical as it is simple direct cash transfers to the world's poor. Give Directly believes that people in poverty deserve the dignity to choose for themselves how best to improve their lives. 
Its successful model has helped build a consensus in the international community that unconditional cash transfers are one of the most effective approaches to addressing extreme poverty. The evidence is strong that this is a highly effective, high impact way to help the world's poor. And I'm thrilled that we will shortly be hearing from the new president of Give Directly, Rory Stewart, and the Give Directly director, recipients advocacy, Carol and Teddy, about their work. But before I pass over to our MC, I've got some exciting news about a donation match. Uh, we have secured a matching call from a very generous donation um, from an Australian donor to give directly to support the efficacy of this event. If you feel moved and if you feel compelled to donate to help the world's poor directly, donations of up to $50,000 Australian and about $30,000 in US dollars, uh, totaling about $100,000 Australian will be matched and doubled until the limit is reached. The link for the donation platform will be, will be shared in the chat during the course of the conversation, so please keep an eye out for this. There will be time for questions and answers at the, towards the end of our hour together. And if you would like to ask questions of Will, Rory or Caroline, please submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Questions can be submitted anonymously any, any time, uh, sorry, any, if you choose. But now it's time, I would like to welcome our MC, Will Brown. Will Brown is based in Nairobi, Kenya, as, and is an award-winning Africa correspondent for The Telegraph and a senior associate at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. Welcome, Will. Hi, Louise, thanks for having me. Very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's it's uh, just looking through the chat. There's quite an extraordinary array of people here from all over the world. We've got Bangladesh, Melbourne, uh, Italy. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so great to see so many, so many, uh, so much interest um, globally. I mean, there's so many people all over the world want to help solve this problem, and no doubt want to hear more about uh, this particular type of intervention and what they can do to help. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think without further ado, I should I should introduce um, Rory. Uh, so Rory Stewart is a, is a British academic, author, diplomat and former politician. Uh, he served as a member of parliament from 2010 to 2019 and has had lots of different ministerial roles, including uh, African minister and secretary of state for international development, where he oversaw a budget of uh, 20 billion pounds in foreign aid alone. Uh, prior to working government, Rory was chair and executive of the Turquoise uh, Mountain Foundation based in Kabul. Uh, he's also served as a civilian, gov civilian governor in Iraq. And before that, in 2002, he walked uh, for almost two years uh, across, Af uh, across Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, India and Nepal. Uh, earlier this year, uh, he became um, president and CEO of Give Directly. Um, so yeah, Rory, welcome. Thank you for having me. Great. So I think before we get into the weeds, I would like to just, um, for those who don't know you, just ask a bit about your background. Um, maybe you could give us an introduction. I mean, what were you doing in Afghanistan, Iraq, and then in Westminster? I mean, basically, how did you get here? Oh, thank you. So um, I guess I've been working, I, I'm almost 50, I'm going to be 50 in a, a year's time. So I've been working in and around international development for, for most of my adult life. I began, uh, I, I grew up in Hong Kong and Malaysia, and I began uh, working in the British Embassy in Indonesia uh, in the mid nineties and then in Montenegro. And then I served in a number of uh, these post-conflict zones. So Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, set up, as you said, my own nonprofit in Afghanistan at uh, the end of, uh, from 2005 to 2010, and uh, also taught at, at Harvard and Yale universities, where I've I've also been teaching international development. And I came across uh, Give Directly first when I was running the UK's Department for International Development, and uh, then later when Give Directly persuaded me to see some of their programs in Rwanda, which impressed me enormously. And and it was from that that I I decided to. To come on board. Fantastic. Okay. Well, all right. So, so as president of Give Directly, could you give us the organization's sort of elevator pitch? Um, what do you do and where do you do it? 
So Gift Equity is a specialist in direct cash transfer and comes out of a movement that's now, I guess, been going for about 15 years at scale, which on the basis of nearly 300 academic papers now written worldwide, has concluded that giving cash directly to individuals gives them dignity, gives them independence, leverages the fact that somebody, particularly and we, we focus on the extreme poor, somebody in extreme poverty in a, in a community is likely to know much better what their priorities are, what their needs are, what their context is in an outside actor. And the results are very, very striking, particularly on nutrition, on incomes, on education enrollment, and even on the development of businesses. We're finding that cash outperforms many traditional development uh, approaches. So if, if I think back to my own life, I, I've been in a system where for a, many generations, people often from the global north have gone to villages in Asia or in Africa and effectively tried to, in inverted commas, capacity build people. But that really means an enormous amount of money traditionally has been spent on trying to teach and design and implement programs on other people's behalf. And if you look at the total amount of money that's spent on that, the actual uh, output sometimes quite limited. Uh, look at Malawi, for example, which is a country I think you know well. Nearly $17 billion has been spent in Malawi over the last 15 years by the international development community. And poverty in Malawi, according to the World Bank figures, has really not changed over that period. It's gone from about 70.6% uh, to about 70.8% at the moment. So we, we are facing a real challenge in international development. And I suppose mm -hmm. Give Directly believes that one of the solutions, not the only solution, but one of the most powerful solutions is to provide direct cash assistance to extreme poor and let them make their own choices. Mm -hmm. So, so when you were head of DFID, I mean, you had this enormous budget which dwarfs um, some economies in the developing world, 20 billion pounds. And, but you were quite anti the idea of giving people cash. Um, could you expl explain your, your, your reasoning there? Um, did you think, did you have an idea that people would just go and spend their money on drugs and booze or? I've, so I've been on a big journey, you're absolutely right. I, and it's it's been interesting thinking back on why as different Secretary of State, incidentally, well, it's probably my, my fault, but I think our budget is about $20 billion rather than, rather than pounds at that, that point at a point when the pound was a bit stronger than it is now. Um, so I, I think at DFID, there were probably a number of different anxieties. One of them was around taxpayers and whether this is what taxpayers expected with their money, and particularly an expectation that had built up over many decades that you're not supposed, in inverted commas, to, to follow the proverb, to give someone a fish, you're supposed to teach them how to fish. And uh, giving cash seemed like a very large fish giving program as opposed to a teaching to fish program. The second thing I'm afraid is that it's deeply threatening to development agencies because it calls into question everything that we've been doing and all our jobs. Uh, and I remember saying to people, what on earth are we all doing? We've got thousands of civil servants. We've all studied international development. People are specialists in nutrition and agriculture. And are you really saying that there's no point to any of us, that what we've been doing for the last 60, 70 years has largely been a waste of time and we should just be giving cash to people instead? And that, that is a pretty, pretty difficult message um, for organizations. I think now the way to convince my successor or my equivalents in USAID to look at cash is to really just look at the evidence and try to get them into the field. And that's what didn't happen to me in DFID. Nobody took me to a Rwandan village and said, look at what difference, you know, 550 or $700 can make to someone's life. Look how instantaneous that difference is. Look at the fact it's making a difference to their housing, to the education of their children, to their ability to connect to electricity, to their health insurance, to their livestock, and all of it so quickly. I think it's that, 
it's the for me it's the almost it's getting away paradoxically from the academic papers which we pride ourselves on to actually putting someone on the ground and just seeing how much difference it makes and so i'd be interested to know i mean how has give directly's programming changed over the um i mean first of all how long have you been around and how has your programming changed throughout that time give directly has been around for about 15 years and it began very very small it began as a project run by uh, economists at Harvard and MIT, who raised a small amount of money, largely from family and friends, and started a, a pilot project in Kenya. And over the years, has grown very, very significantly. So um, last year, we, we spent well over $200 million, or delivered well over $200 million to recipients of extreme poverty, and were um, and have been running programs in, in Rwanda, in Uganda, in Malawi, uh, in Liberia, in Togo, Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, and now in Yemen, Bangladesh, and we're looking at, at opening India. So it, it's it's been a big, big journey, and um, it's taken us from an organization with a couple of volunteers to now quite a complex management task of a you know, $200 million budget, 1,000 staff, uh, 12 countries at the moment, and delivering very, very... Um, I think interesting programs, but also having to learn how to work more closely with governments uh, and with other donor partners, partly because as we do more, we're, we're uh, interacting much more with poverty at a much larger scale, which begins to become more relevant to government planning. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I guess it's something, I, I, I wanna play devil's advocate a bit here. So look, the international community, has been sold a lot of dud silver bullets, um, which have turned out not to work. And so I'd like to, you know, what are the, I'd like to ask you, what are the problems with these kind of cash, uh, these direct cash transfers? Uh, for example, I mean, uh, from the studies I've looked at, while they're very, very, they're, they're often very, very positive, um, the, often the, the, the cash donation has been done on a relatively local small scale to maybe around 50,000 people, if I'm correct. And so, has, would you like to try this on a national level? And if so, what problematics could come up with that? So I, I think that's a really good question. And I think in international development, you do need uh, a very significant degree of humility. So cash does make a difference in, in a very straightforward way. I mean, if you are, you know, somebody living on, on a dollar a day, uh, and, and on a dollar a day, you are the equivalent of a dollar a day, because that may be a bit in cash and a bit in kind, but you are really not able to meet your basic needs. You're, you're not able to eat properly. You're not able to shelter yourself properly. You're not able to clothe yourself properly. If you're uh, given a um, what we might typically give, let's say $550, that, that really does make an enormous difference um, in, in that particular family's life. That is enough for you to buy a cow. That's enough for you to fix your house. That's enough for you to be able to get, get some food on the table. But the more interesting question, I suppose, is what are the multiplier effects? How does a dollar become more than a dollar? And in some cases, it really does seem to. In Kenya, for example, we had a big study, uh, partly with researchers from Oxford University, and we found that Every dollar delivered resulted in about two and a half dollars worth of benefit, savings, income, investment, some of which was sustained over quite a long period of time. And that's because of economic uh, mechanisms. That's because consumption drives up the economy. That's because people invest also in productive businesses that make their own incomes and develop their own savings with that money. But and this is, this is leading to the, the downside. A different political context, a different environmental context might make that multiplier less. So um, if you have a situation of extreme drought, it is much more difficult for someone to get off the ground than it is if they are in a, a fertile, well-functioning area of the Kenyan economy. If you are in a country which has a very, very perverse 
form of agricultural subsidy system, it might be very tough for a smallholder farmer actually to sell their goods because the prices can be mucked up very, very significantly by the way the government conducts itself. And if you're operating in a country which has good infrastructure, obviously you can get your goods to market that much more easily and you get more of a benefit. So we can't pretend that cash operates in isolation. Governments matter, infrastructure matters. And at a large scale, and this maybe is what you were hinting at, we also have to think about whether there are consequences for bigger economic trends like inflation, if a large amount of cash is delivered. So I think what we can say is that it is a relatively risk-free intervention in the sense that you know that you're making a difference to an individual life. But in terms of doing the macroeconomic plotting of the bigger impact on the economy, uh, that we won't really know until we start operating at a much larger scale, which, as you say, I'm very keen to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I guess just some of the problems you hinted at there kind of feed into my next question, which is, I mean, so so what about using these cash transfers in conflict zones or areas blighted by massive insecurity? I mean, for example, um, it's all very well and good to do this in a stable area of Kenya or Rwanda, but I mean, ca I mean, can this approach work in countries like South Sudan or Central African Republic, where there are multiple kind of predatory forces which could take that money off people? So good challenge. Um, and we're, we're, ex we're doing now a program in Yemen, which is a country in conflict. So we're beginning to learn a bit about this. I think, of course, it is very difficult operating in those contexts. But it's very difficult doing almost anything developmental in those contexts. So I think it, it is important to understand that you need to compare cash to what the alternatives are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In South Sudan, for example, uh, yes, it's true that um, groups could steal cash, but it's also true that if you try to drive a large truck through with food aid, that food aid will also be stolen by militias along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Total absence security is a big problem. I think, though, as we look at this, there may be some advantages to cash over other mechanisms, particularly in areas where there is mobile phone saturation. So if you take an environment like Afghanistan, which, of course, is a country which has been defined by conflict and difficulty of access, strangely, mobile phone penetration is more than 90%. And if people can move on to mobile money, we will be able to deliver money directly to somebody's phone. That means that you're not driving a truck through, you're not putting it through the hands of militia commanders or local village chiefs. It is arriving directly at the recipient. And that means the money is then dispersed very, very widely through the community. That doesn't mean that a local government or a local militia group could not, in theory, try to tax people. But in practice, if you think about the political dynamics of that, these groups are not likely to be trying to impose significant taxes or steal all the money from the extreme poor across a very wide area, because that would radically undermine their own power base. Okay, so, thanks. So, so I've, I've been sending an interesting question in the chat. So, so how are the mechanics of passing on cash? Ha, sorry, how are the mechanics? Of passing on cash to remain untainted by the problems that bog down other government programs where you know, billions of dollars can often not yield that much impact? Well, the answer is we've been the uh, give directly, and I said say we because I, I'm relatively new to the organization, but give directly has been the beneficiary of this amazing revolution, which you're very aware of, Will, and those of us who are joining from Africa are very well aware of, but maybe the world is less aware of, which is the revolution of mobile money in Africa. So most people now uh, in many communities in Africa use their phones, text messages from their phones as their bank account to pay for everything. And this means that we have been able over the last 15 years to deliver money directly to the phones of the extreme poor. And if the extreme poor don't have phones to issue them with a phone, six, $7 Nokia phone and they are then able to receive that money themselves as an individual directly without it having to go through a government 
or go through a village chief and without us having to drive uh, a large sack of, of paper cash in, into a village. Um, now, um, well, one thing I, I wanted to mention, we're, we're very lucky because I, Caroline Tetty, who um, understands Give Directly much more powerfully than I do and has been with us for, for, for many years, has also joined us um, on, on the call from Africa. And so at some point, I'd, I'd love to bring her into the conversation, yeah, but I know you're aware she's there. Yeah. Let's let's bring Caroline on. So oh, I'll do the 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 the, the um, proper introduction. So Caroline Tetty is a uh, the director's director of uh, recipients advocacy at Div Give Directly. Um, she's a social scientist with more than uh, with almost two decades of uh, experience in the public sector in international NGOs and local NGOs. And um, previously, she led a national program in Kenya to to deworm over six million uh, school children per year. So Caroline, if, if you're connected, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Will. And a pleasure meeting everyone here and to speak about our work at Give Directly. Fantastic. OK, so you've been at Give Directly a, a long time now. I think it'd be really valuable to, for, for listeners, for viewers to, to hear from you about some stories from the field. Sure, absolutely. And um, I think before speaking about stories from the field, just to echo that my experience working in development is almost, I would say, four fifths of the time that I've spent out here. So I have been in government. Uh, I have been in the traditional aid and now seven years at Give Directly. So uh, quite a lot of things that I have learned. In terms of experiences of people who are living in extreme poverty, I think uh, the one interesting thing that you know, you'd want to start from is okay what does it mean to live in poverty? Because a lot of things is said about people living in poverty. We read a lot of you know, economics about living under a dollar nine a day, $2.15 a day. And the actual existence or life in a poor situation is quite harrowing. It's quite dehumanizing. Sometimes even for us who live here in Africa, there are places where you go to and you wonder, why people have to live as they do. And I will give two examples. One example is if you have a mother with three little children, she has a responsibility to feed those children and she has a husband. In this context, men generally are supposed to be putting food on the table of their families. And a lot of times when they find them, themselves unable to do that, they would vacate the family and abandon the woman with the children. So this story is about a woman who was abandoned by her husband, remains with her three children, um, seven, four, and two. Every day she has to eke a living to bring food to the table. One of these days she's not able to bring food to the table and the children not knowing what is happening with their mother sit around her cooking stove waiting for food. The mother, unable to explain what is happening with her, puts three stones inside a pan and lights the fire and starts cooking three stones incessantly. No water in the, in the pan, no nothing. She is literally boiling stones. And why is she doing this? She's putting hope in the eyes of her children that something is coming soon. And she knows at the back of her mind, she's waiting for them to fall asleep. And true to her word, they fall asleep and she turns off the fire and they all go to sleep hungry. That is poverty. A second example, when people talk about roof over my head, you will be thinking about a tin roof, a permanent house, tiled floors. And in some moments you'd be like, okay, a grass touched roof could be bad enough and that could be poverty. That is not what extreme poverty is. Extreme poverty is situations where we live and go visit communities where people live in houses built with twigs and covered with polythene. Literally, the height of the house cannot cover a five, two foot woman like I am, not very tall, but you have to walk inside that house. So one of these days I walk inside a house, I have to speak to this woman and we have to squat because for respect, we want to be able to identify with her in her situation. Unfortunately, the rain comes and we all have to move out, including herself. But she doesn't move out to shelter. She moves out to secure the vital 
belongings that she has in that house so that when the rain stops, they have a place to sleep. That is poverty. We have seen cash change the lives of people living in this level of poverty here in Kenya in many, and in many other African countries. One example that I have seen is when we talk about um, health, quality health, that people who live in poverty have different factors that affect their health. It can be nutrition, water and sanitation. Uh, it can be, um, you know, normal health issues, reproductive health, and you can name it. One example, community that had been living without latrines or toilets for that matter. When you talk about development, you will hear, as Rory has said, lots of trainings delivering information on why it is important to have a latrine because open defecation will make you fall sick with typhoid, cholera, and all other communicable diseases. This community had received all the education and the awareness from both government and non-governmental organizations so that they could be able to build latrines. And three years government was waiting for them to declare their community open defecation free. They continued defecating in the open. And you can imagine what that means. We came in as Give Directly, sent cash to this community. And in three weeks, we did not go back to check what they had done because we, our time for going to do the monitoring had not come. Government itself was there before us. And you can't believe it. They called us back to ask us, what is it that you did to this community? Three years we've been asking them to build latrines. There has never been. And today we are planning a government launch of an open defecation free community in this village because of the work that we did. We gave them the power. They knew what they needed. They made the decision. And today that community is open defecation free. That is illnesses weighted away right there in one instance, just delivering cash in one day to people living in poverty. So Caroline, I think it'd be very interesting to hear from you. I mean, what is, um, so from your experience, I mean, when a, when a community, when you give cash straight into a community and a, a, and a mother of three gets this cash, generally what's the first thing they spend their money on? Obviously it varies, but th there must be some trends. Absolutely. When people live in extreme poverty, the biggest challenge that they face is nutrition. Like I have said, basic needs is a big, big problem. In most of the communities that we are working in, you will hear people talk about the investments that they're making with the money. But the first thing that we, they will tell you is that I also wanted my children to eat better, to have an assurance of food. So among the many things that they do, they will bulk food. So it's not just going to buy food and eating at the moment. They know that tomorrow, there will be another need. So as they invest in small businesses, they invest in building houses, they know that they need food for today and tomorrow for their children. So they will bulk. Most of the time you see them bulking things like corn or dried grains because those can take them for a longer time. So nutrition is a big, big story in the programs that we're running. Okay. And so, so Caroline, you, you, you also lead the... Um internal audit teams, I think, countering fraud, where you lead efforts countering fraud. I mean, maybe you could give us a quick rundown of, 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 of how these internal audit teams work and how you, because I think that's probably one of the number one fears on many people's minds that the idea of just giving this cash is it's gonna be spent badly, or it's gonna be stolen. How do you kind of stop that from happening? Absolutely, thank you very much. So um, internal audit team in simple terms for those who may want to understand is, a team of officers that we have put together to help us monitor risks associated with fraud. Their work is to detect and investigate fraud and also make recommendations to give directly for how we can be able to reduce fraud at a minimum. In general, we have set for ourselves a standard that of all the transfers that we are sending out, we should never lose more than 0.5%. Of course, we must understand that it will never be fraud free. There will, there will be a level of losses that will happen. We want to keep it at a minimum, 0.5%. To date, we've been able to keep it at 0.2%, which makes us really proud about this team. Now, this team, if you want to think about it, we exist 
as a deterrence. So even before we do the detection and the investigation, our very existence is a deterrence internally for our staff, externally to the communities we are working in, that fraud should not happen because someone is there watching. We also detect this very fast and resolve it very, very quickly. And, and am I right in saying that your audit teams are anonymous? And if so, could you anonymous from the from the, they're, they're, they're not known by your other members of staff? And if so, could you explain why? Absolutely. Um, the, the, the investigation team is anonymous. We firewall them from the rest of the organization for different reasons. Number one, we want to create a decent level of independence in their investigations. When they are in anonymous, they are able to look at the issues they interact with in the field from a very objective view. It's also been very clear to us that when they are anonymous, their reports are more credible because they do not use uh, you know, third party judgments or they're not influenced because they are doing this at the singular responsibility that they are having. And we have seen, um, you know, commendations from donors such as FCDO reviewing our programs and saying, because of the existence of an anonymous team, we don't even have to bring an independent audit team to come and check your work because you have yourself created a firewall that creates that independence. The other thing that we do is also anonymity helps to protect uh, this stuff, because sometimes investigations can be sensitive and we want to make sure that they're doing it in an environment where they are feeling very safe to conduct the work that they're doing and with the confidence that they need to, to do it well. That's great. Thank you. So so I think there's a there's another issue which we I don't think we've addressed so far, which is which is gender issues and how that um, how you deal with that? How do you make sure, for example, the, the man in the family is at the table with cash or, or something like this? How do you respond to mitigate the, 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 these, these issues? Um, so when you think about this, because we are delivering cash at the household level, the first assumption would be that men will be most powerful and will intimidate the women and get the money out of them. The first mm -hmm. thing that we do is that in our program decisions, we ensure that in couple relationships, we enroll the family with the man and the woman together. We give them an opportunity to make the decision who of the two of them should receive the money on behalf of the household. We educate them on the fact that the transfers are meant to create change within the household. But we also monitor, like I said, you can never assume that nothing will happen. We monitor if this actually happens. And to date, our data is indicating that GiveDirectly has recorded a low of 0.1% in conflicts at the household. That's pretty low, even for national average, both reported and actively investigated cases. We have a very low level of conflict. Most of them have been resolved and uh, families have not been broken because of the transfers. Mm -hmm. And so I get it's something I'm also quite interested in is, is, is one, I mean, how do you select the, the communities where you're going to work in? That's one. And then two, I mean, how I mean, surely if I'm, let's say, in a village somewhere and then my neighbor gets a thousand dollars from a stranger or something, that's going to create some conflict, isn't it? That's going to create a little bit of jealousy. So, yeah. How do you what's the answer to those two? So, first of all, um, like we say we exist to deliver unconditional cash to people living in extreme poverty and putting choices in their hands. Mm -hmm. When we are doing that, we have to use data in order to help us understand where extreme poverty exists. As you may imagine, we start off with nationally existing data, for example, census data, to help direct us into the communities that are the poorest. Once we locate this using national data, we engage communities and local leaders in those areas to help us understand very clearly contextual definitions of what defines them as poorest. Most of the time, what we have seen is national data has brought us very close to, um, you know, the exact places that are, ex ex uh, you know, experiencing extreme poverty. And when you speak to local leaders, they actually confirm that actually these are communities that are very poor. Now, do people have jealousies and conflicts across communities because others are given money and others are not? Level one, development aid as, his, as, his, as it has existed for decades will never be able to reach everyone at the same time. And we make it very clear to communities that we are starting with your neighbors who are most 
affected by poverty. And we are walking this journey slowly by slowly as we come to neighboring villages. What we have seen is when people start and say, why aren't we given an opportunity? Month, two months, three months later, they come back and say, we really like the model that you're using Give Directly because we can see that while we thought that we would never be reached, today we have actually benefited from this transfer. And you hear people say, we know we have not been reached, but we know that um, there is a reason why Give Directly has selected our neighbors, and we hope that uh, you know the changes that resulted in those communities can also impact us. And like Rory said, there is impact that goes beyond the recipient communities uh, when we send the cash. It doesn't just benefit the community that is receiving the money. Even the neighbors from our study has there has been proof that they benefit from the transfers because money trans people employ each other um you know neighbors relate with each other as as they share in the in the resources they have that's fantastic thank you very much Colin. i think rory just wants to come in on this point rory yes so uh, caroline Titi has put her finger on on something which is a sort of truth about international development which is very rarely spoken about uh, if you think about it in in the developed world governments have the resources to be able to try to ensure that there is fair distribution across the country. So if you were living in Stockholm uh, in Sweden, you would expect to be able to receive the same unemployment benefits, the same disability benefits as you would if you were living in Sud Italia two hours outside Stockholm. But within international development, what has tended to happen over the years, and it, it's a very, very uh, disturbing phenomenon, is that not just NGOs, not just charities, but even big institutions like the UN and the World Bank end up going into countries without sufficient resources to reach everybody in the country. So they will often focus on doing stuff in a few villages, which raises a question of fairness. You know, why are people working in Kelife in Kenya, and then they're not working in Lake Turkana, where there might be more extreme poverty. Um, one of the reasons that I'm now very, very keen to try to work with donors, um, individual people giving money, but also governments, to see if we can raise much larger sums of money, mm -hmm. is to see if we can begin to develop equitable national programs. My real dream would be to as it were, build up a fully technologically enabled social safety net system for an entire country, so that you then had the kind of pipes, as it were, that exist in, in Sweden, and we could come back to Sweden, but um, which would then allow you to distribute money to everybody in the country, and perhaps in the future, allow you to use the same pipes to target. So if you wanted to target people who were disabled, or you wanted to find women with younger children, because you were concerned about infant nutrition, you could use the same systems. But obviously at the moment, we, we are still in a world, not, not just Give Directly, but the World Bank and everybody else, where one doesn't have the resources to do that. And you end up focusing on particular people or particular communities. That's great. So, so we've got about 20 minutes left. So if anyone wants to send in a Q&A for Rory or, or Caroline, please shoot them in and I'll try out my best to answer the, uh, to, to ask them. We're not gonna be able to answer all the questions, but I think, uh, you, you can send them through to Louise. Um, but, but Rory, I, I've got one question for you, which is which is a bit kind of a bit more abstract, you know, away from the down to earth stuff. I mean, you know, we, so so I want to talk about the sudden fall of FTX and Sam Bankman Fried. It's provoked quite a bit of discussion in you know newspapers, journals like the Economist and stuff about what this means for the future of the effective altruism movement. And I know that you were talking. I think you you, you spoke about this. You, you were talking to to. Uh, to free just before um, everything collapsed. So it'd just be very interesting. Just get one minute, just your take on that. Yeah, it, I, I think it is very challenging for us. Um, he, he actually was not a, a major donor to, to give directly because Sam Bankman-Fried was, uh, and I was dealing with his foundation just three weeks before this collapse, trying to persuade them to get involved in a big extreme poverty program. But I think it, it sort of puts your finger, puts finger on the point that you're making. Sam Bankman Fried appeared to be somebody who was worth many, many billions of dollars and appeared to want to give it away in the most effective way. So I had approached him and his foundation 
to say, would they be prepared to give us one and a half billion dollars to see if we could uh, actually address poverty almost at a national scale in the country? And I think there are a couple of things there which are interesting. I mean, one is, of course, how strange it is to think that a few weeks ago, there was somebody out there who might potentially have been able to give one and a half billion dollars and therefore reach one and a half million people mm -hmm. uh, in extreme poverty. Um, perhaps more, perhaps nearly three million people in extreme poverty. Um, and secondly, the odd power dynamics that come out of that, which is what's involved if you're a charity raising money, of thinking back on that, being reflective about um, how polite one has to be to someone, how much one's trying to adjust to their own views in order to try to, to secure the, the donations that you need for the extreme poor. And then I think finally, there's obviously a big question that we're all struggling with in the movement, which is about, I suppose, morality or ethics and effectiveness. This is a movement that came out of, a, I suppose, a utilitarian philosophical tradition, which is uh, a tradition which, you know, in the hands of, sort of in the consequentialist hands of someone like Machiavelli, which is where Sam Bankman Freed appeared to end up seem to believe the end justified the means. Mm -hmm. And he really seems, as we look at him, not to have taken very seriously the question of moral conduct in his business in generating the money that he was trying to give away. Um, so I'm, I'm not a philosopher, and this is obviously a, a organization founded by one of the most distinguished philosophers in the world. So I, I feel I'm treading on difficult ground, but... Um, Maybe it's something that Peter Singh himself should be reflecting on more than me, but it's definitely been a very, very big wake up call for us. Thanks, Rory. I, I think we're going to have to move on to very quick answers now to questions. So I want to get as many of these through as possible. So uh, Matthew Walker uh, has asked, while cash and voucher transfers certainly improve outcomes, value for money in most sectors, do you think uh, there are any specific areas or specialist fields where capacity building, especially through uh, specialist training, uh, is still important for sustainable development programming? So basically, you know, are there Got capacity building in some places? Yeah. Well, so 100%. Um, cash is not the answer to everything. I think it's the answer to many more things than we believe. As I said, it's very, very powerful in nutrition, education, enrollment, got very good data on what it means for setting up businesses. And I think it's shocking that only 2% of international development spend goes into cash. I'd like to see it much, much higher. I'd like 60, 70% of the money spent internationally to be in cash, but not 100%. There are many, many valuable things that you can do, uh, particularly if you're focused on a narrow specialist area. If your objective is not general, right? If you're not just simply trying to address poverty, but you have a very specific interest, for example, in trying to deal with malaria, buying somebody a bed net is a very cheap and effective way of ensuring that somebody, uh, that people are less likely to contract malaria. Um, if you are interested in transferring a specific form of knowledge, then of course the capacity building program can be very effective. And I think we need to be open also to the ways in which we can combine cash with other programs while being thoughtful about efficiency. So I think there is a good argument to say that some form of financial literacy training could be helpful if somebody's receiving a large amount of cash. But that financial literacy training needs to be efficient, cost effective. You don't want to end up spending, as unfortunately often programs do, $200 on the financial literacy training, and then give someone $200 cash when giving them $400 cash in the first place would make much more difference to their life. Okay, so so a more practical question here. Uh, not sure who this is from, but uh, I, I've been donating, it says, I've been donating 10% of my income for a while, but when I talk to my friends about um, effective altruism, lo the logic of the effective altruism movement, um, it is very hard to convince them over the idea. Um, are there any tips on this? Um, if we, we keep this one quick. Yeah, so it's, it's it's I, I, I'll do this one and then I'll maybe let, let, give the next one to Caroline Tetty. Um, the... I think it is very tough. I mean, firstly, thank you very much. I think it's incredibly um, important and meaningful. And 
I think many people on this call will be doing that. And I think most of us who do give significant amounts of money um, feel that there is a real purpose to it and it has meaning in the lives of the recipients and it has forms of meaning in our own lives. I, I think the, the best way still of convincing someone if you can't convince them just in terms of intellectual argument is to get them into the field. Because I think when you're in the field, you can realize that effectively uh, what is a dollar to somebody in the developed world is a hundred dollars to someone in the developing world. That a hundred dollars, which is something that somebody might spend on an expensive meal with a partner, given to somebody in extreme poverty makes a life-changing difference. Um, and I think the more you realize that, the more you feel comfortable giving money. I think that's probably the final thing that I'll, I'll now be quiet because you said I should be short. But the final thing is trusting the impact of the money. I think one of the things that puts people off giving money uh, is a sense that it will be wasted. And I think for me, Give Directly has been a very moving experience because it's a nonprofit where I feel very comfortable giving money to it because I'm very comfortable with the sense of what happens to that money, how much difference it makes. That's great. Thanks, Rory. So, so if we can pivot back to um, Caroline. So Caroline, the, there's a comment in the, in the chat here. Uh, and it says, I would like to know what Caroline's comment is on the phrase, it is better to teach uh, someone to fish to get money than to give them a fish to give money. Um, I understand that many people, I understand that many people, because they do not understand the Give Directly project, have this kind of doubt. Uh, so so I th the question is basically asking, is it better uh, to, to, to teach someone to fish or to buy them a fish? I think that's the question. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a widely held belief, but uh, one thing that we would want to say is there are also assumptions that when people say it is better to teach people how to fish, the assumption is that people don't know how to fish. In a lot of situations, people actually know how to fish. What they don't have is the money to buy the fishing rods, is the money to buy the boat, is the, the facilitation in order to be a better fisherman. I personally come from a fishing community, literally. And I can tell you, the poverty in my community is not because they don't know how to fish. And this comes back to the paternalistic attitude that we have had in traditional international aid, that we make assumptions that we know better what people can do with money, we know better what problems people are going through, and we have the solutions. Mm -hmm. We'll share an, an example of one really intriguing recipient story that, um, you know, I just came through last two weeks ago of a man who received cash from Give Directly. Not so much if you asked me $200. And if you are talking about teaching someone what to, uh, whether to, um, you're teaching people how to fish, then this man would need someone to teach him about uh, health about financial management, about taking care of uh, domestic animals, veterinary uh, care for their animals, like almost five different programs. The guy received money from Give Directly, paid a debt, bought food, bought medicine for his animals, bought some animals, put up a water tank, all in one go. No one came to teach him to fish. He went out and fished with the money in his hands. It's that simple. Not to say that teaching people is bad, but like Rory has said, there are moments when people will need to be taught, but we should not always get lost in the assumption that people always don't know what to do. So, uh, yeah, I th I th so, so, yeah, so basically you're saying that it's all well and good to teach someone how to fish, but if they don't have the money for a fishing rod, it's a bit pointless and actually you should, yeah. Um, Absolutely. So, so, Absolutely. Yeah, so, so we're getting an absolute wave of questions here. I'm going to try and pick some of them, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to get to all of them with the time constraints. Um, so I think that there is, so what about this? So uh, this is a question, I'm not sure who from, but it says food bulk purchase question mark, is the transport infrastructure to village communities impacting how the cash transfer is spent? So basically, 
to what extent does logistics or connections to to let's say in Kenya city like Nairobi how is that impacting how the, 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 the these are all good questions and um uh, the answer is of course it does matter but what we found is that markets respond much more flexibly than many people feared so of course it's true that there can be a very very extreme situation if you are in a very remote area of Somalia in an extreme prolonged drought it, it can be actually difficult to secure food at all and in some of those situations it may make sense for humanitarian agencies to actually move physical food but in most situations in which you work uh, delivering cash is the way to do it it's much more efficient it allows people to buy what they actually need the local market will respond that benefits the local farmers who are actually growing the food locally rather than what has happened in the past which is important from idaho yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i think to rory's to rory's answer will um we saw this firsthand in uganda in one very remote area where give directly you know, asked the same same questions that what happens when cash is delivered to very, very remote communities, and you can't believe it. Economics and resources and infrastructure follow money. That the, the fact that we sent money to that community, we started seeing an increased penetration of mobile phones, increased penetration of traders, and, you know, you do not go to set up a shop in a place where there is no money to go and buy your products. And this we have also seen, uh, you know, here in Kenya, in Kilifi, where at some point we went into a community where the market was so small, we were so worried that people may not be able to find ways in which they can be able to spend their transfers. Today, the business that is booming in that community is not what I saw five years ago. So again, we should not keep people in poverty by making assumptions that because they do they lack it will never happen there mm -hmm. are natural responses to resource availability that help people to you know adapt to the situations that they are in that's great so so we've got one question here um Rory, we have heard you speak about Give Directly's plan to end poverty in entire countries. What are important findings, learnings that these pilot countries should generate? And also, I think on the back of that, we should ask, I mean, where are potential good places, do you think, where this, this program could work? Well, we're very, very early stages of exploring this. And of course, you know, doing this will require the whole world to come together, because when you're dealing with countries in Africa with where you have many, many millions of people in extreme poverty, we would have to raise very significant amounts of money to be able to do this. So I think the first thing is, is to be realistic about whether in the current economic situation this can be done. But certainly we would love to do it and we're pushing very hard to do that. Um, the, and the reason why we're doing it is that, uh, is both in terms, of course, the individual recipient and transforming their lives, but also that the story of what is now the Sustainable Development Goal 1, ending extreme poverty, is, is very depressing, particularly mm -hmm. in Africa. There were 160 million people living in extreme poverty in Africa in 1980. There are 470 million people today. In percentage terms, that's barely moved over more than 40 years. And the hope is that if we could demonstrate in a single country or two countries, that cash could make a real difference to people living in extreme poverty, you could then shift the much bigger aid system and have an example that could perhaps be applied more globally. Well, that's a great that's a great cap to um, the session. I think I'm going to thank you both so much for for answering my questions and 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 the, and the the questions in the Q and A. I'm going to give it back to Louise now, um, who's going to have some closing remarks. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Rory. Thanks, Caroline. Um, wow, what a what a session. Um, I um, have been really moved by some of the stories, but also really excited about uh, the work that Give Directly is doing. Uh, just to know, if your question was not answered, please send an email to info at thelifeyoucansave.org, and we will answer that um, outside of this webinar. Uh, but just a big thank you for joining a conversation with Give Directly brought to you by The Life You Can Save. They are doing such incredible work alleviating suffering and empowering people who live in poverty. And they have bold ambitions for the future. So if you would like to make a life-changing difference to a person living in poverty, please support their work through the Life You Can Save's matching campaign using the links that my colleagues have shared in the chat. You will also be sent this link in a follow-up email that you'll receive um, following this, uh, with a link to this webinar as well. 
And of course, if you'd like to support our work here at The Life You Can Save, also considered to be an effective charity in its own right, please consider a donation to our operations. But thank you again for attending, and we at The Life You Can Save hope to see you at a similar event in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.